Hello and welcome to Research in Financial Markets. My name is Klaus Grobis. I have the position as an adjunct professor of economics at the University of Uvescula, and I have the position assistant professor of finance at the University of Vasa. I will teach the first part of this course entitled uh, Research in Financial Markets. And the part that I'm teaching covers the topics or covers topics in the field of asset pricing. So, in general, asset pricing can be divided into two major fields of research. Okay? So, asset pricing, we have on the one hand the theoretical asset pricing, which basically uses makes use of mathematical models and tries to basically to derive economic implications using differential equations and pretty advanced more sophisticated mathematics yeah so this is the theoretical asset pricing tap so on the other hand we have the empirical asset pricing e AP and the empirical asset pricing is more concerned about figuring out what drives the cross section of asset returns. Yeah? A lot of research is concerned or investigates the cross section of stock returns, especially in the US market. We have uh, research has been done investigating cross sectional patterns in currencies or in commodities. And most recently, there is a field of uh, research emerging that tries to uncover cross-sectional patterns in digital financial markets, such as cryptocurrencies. Yeah? So, in empirical research, we usually apply more econometric methods or statistical method methods to explore patterns in, in assets. Yeah? So, and this is also what I do mostly in my research, uh, my, my research is related to uh, empirical asset price pricing and this is also what I will cover in these five lectures. Then we can go one step further and we can divide uh, empirical asset pricing into two other subfields, which is, uh, for instance, anomalies and models. Yeah. So, so one field of research that is related to empirical asset pricing covers anomalies. So what this research is doing is basically um, figuring out if certain characteristics that are, for instance, related to, to, to companies like, like Camara capitalization or book-to-market equity, uh, book-to-market ratio or the profitability ratios or certain other ratios are related to cross-sectional uh, patterns in returns. Yeah. So, on the other hand, we have models. So, this field of research or this, this stream of research is dealing with, uh, is dealing with um, uncovering certain risk factors that span or that explain the cross-section of asset markets. For instance, uh, in your undergraduate studies, you uh, might have encountered the capital as a pricing model. This simple model, uh, where you basically say, okay, the excess returns of stock I at time t can be explained by its exposures beta I against the market factor Rm in excess form at time t. Yeah? So that's basically the idea of the cap m. So in the cap m world, the only thing that matters is actually the systematic risk yeah? that is basically explained or that is given by the market factor in excess form. Yeah? In the Farmer and Friend three factor model, which you have, which you should have also encountered during your undergraduate studies. Yeah, this model is extended, so we add two more factors, the size factor and the value factor, and this model basically postulates 
that cross section of returns, or that, that the returns of asset i at time t, the excess returns, are uh, explained by exposures against the market factor plus the, the beta against the size factor plus another beta, let's call it beta h, against the HML factor, which is the value factor. Yeah? So that's in the Thalman French three factor model. So there are many different factor models that try to um, figure out what are the cross sectional risk factors that drive, that explain the evolution of our assets that are here on the left hand side of the equation. So, and by the way, I would recommend you to have pen and paper with you so that you can make your notes because obviously the space is here limited on the whiteboard so I will um, have to delete the things that are right here uh, very fast. Yeah? So in my course or in my part of this course I will be focused on a bit of asset pricing covering anomalies and we'll also talk about models. So the first, the first paper that I would like to discuss is entitled Choosing Factors and written by uh, Farmer and French. Yeah, you, might have, uh, you might know that uh, Farmer won a Nobel Prize in economics a couple of years ago uh, due to his uh, research. And uh, this paper is from 2018. First, when I was uh, thinking about uh, setting up this course, uh, I was thinking about uh, using the 2020 paper, Common French have also a 2020 paper published in the Review of Financial Studies, but uh, I decided not to take this paper because uh, I have some concerns about the methodology used in that paper, so that's why I use uh, the Choosing Factor paper from 2018 published in the Journal of Financial Economics. Yeah? Here's the paper in hard copy just for you to know, but we will go later through it in more detail. So now I would like to, to give you a brief overview of what's going on here in this paper, what are the key concepts or what, what you need to know from a methodological point of view, because uh, in, in this course we pay a lot of attention to the methods, to research methods, how they are used in a different re research context and how could you use it in your own research, in your master thesis, for instance. Yeah? So, the paper is entitled Choosing Factors. Yeah? So, from the, from the title of the paper, we know already that this paper is concerned about models. Yeah? So, in this paper, the, the, the authors test different asset pricing models, different factor models against, against each other in the search for the best suitable model that might explain the cross-sectional patterns in US stock returns. So, um, on, the, on the one hand, uh, in the, pa the paper talks about the so-called left-hand side approach and we also encounter the so-called right-hand side approach. Yeah? So, and then you can break it down even more. We have here nested models. Nested models. And we have on the other hand non nested models. Non nested models. Yeah? So, the left hand side approach basically uses or tests an asset pricing model yeah, where you have, you have basically different test assets sorted by a certain characteristics for instance. You can use simple stocks but most paper use portfolios. Why? Because they are less noisy. So you have on the left hand side let's say 25 test assets sorted by for instance size and book to market ratio and on the right hand side you have a certain factor model. 
for instance, the cap M or the Feynman frame three vector model, five vector model, or a six vector model. What you, what you do then is you have the intercept terms yeah, of these equations, of 25 equations, and you test if these intercept terms are simultaneously different from zero or not. If this pricing model that you want to test works correctly, then you would assume that these pricing errors, these intercept terms in, the, in these regression equations are on average zero. Yeah? Because, because this would imply that this model explains the uh, evolutions of the uh, left-hand side returns properly. But if one or more of these intercept terms would be significant, then you would basically conclude that this model does not price these test cases correctly, and you would say, no, this model is not correct. The right-hand side approach is differently, and uh, we will talk about this uh, in a minute. But let's first elaborate more on the left-hand side approach. Let's say, just as an example, you, have, you, are, you are interested in testing an asset pricing model and you have two test assets or two stocks. Yeah? Let's, you know, let's define those as R1 times T in excess form. So R is the return of asset 1 times T. It can be a portfolio or a stock. And you have a second asset, asset R2, also in excess form at time T. And let's assume we just want to, we are interested in testing if the cap M can explain uh, these two assets. Yeah? So what would we do? You, we would regress the excess returns on an intercept term, is the alpha 1, plus beta 1, that's the corresponding exposure of the test asset 1 against the market factor, beta 1 times R, and x, so the market factor, of course, in excess form, and would also have an error term, epsilon 1 at time t, yeah? covering the regression residuals. So for the second test asset, we would run the same equation, basically. Uh, we would have an intercept term denoted as alpha 2 plus beta 2, which, which is the exposure of the test asset 2 against the market factor, Rxmt, and again we have epsilon 2t, which is the corresponding regression residual uh, from the second equation. Yeah? So, as we already uh, said in the left-hand side approach, we are interested in these guys here, uh, the intercept terms. So, if alpha 1, and we have now a hat here, so it's an estimate, the estimated alpha 1, so the hypothesis is, under the null hypothesis, null hypothesis, we assume that this model is correct, which would mean that alpha 1 or the estimated intercept of the second test asset, alpha 2, is unequal to zero. Or better, under the thesis, sorry, under the thesis, it's assumed to be zero. Actually, both of them. Both are zero. So alpha one is zero and alpha two is equal to zero. So that's the correct null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis, H1, either alpha one is unequal to zero and or alpha hat 2 is unequal to 0. 
Yeah? So it's enough if one of these is unequal to zero. Then, because we test those parameters simultaneously. So these are the hypotheses. So we have, as I told you, we have to estimate these parameters simultaneously. So the method that we use to, to estimate this model is called seemingly seemingly unrelated regression. Seemingly unrelated regression. You can abbreviate it as SUR. Huh? So it's estimated by seemingly unrelated regression technique, the SUR technique. Yeah, we have to take it away now. So why is it important to use this estimation technique? Yeah? So